Myeloid fibrosis is a disease of the bone marrow where there is a reaction to the presence of malignant cells by developing fibers. Therefore, the bone marrow biopsy is a cornerstone of the diagnostic process for myeloid fibrosis. However, you cannot really diagnose myeloid fibrosis only based on a bone marrow biopsy. In fact, there is no one test that would diagnose myeloid fibrosis. There are criteria that need to be fulfilled, and this includes looking at the blood cell count, presence of anemia, for example, presence of leukoerythroblastic reaction, meaning blast, metamyelocytes, and promyelocytes, bone marrow cells in blood, presence of uh, systemic symptoms, presence of uh, increase in lactic dehydrogenase. So one would need to have a complex knowledge about the bone marrow, clinical presentation, enlargement of the spleen, for example, chemistry, and a blood cell count to know whether the patient has a myeloid fibrosis. This is a, a task that clinician needs to undertake, putting things together and having a final diagnosis of myeloid fibrosis. Furthermore, just the presence of fibers in the bone marrow is now known not to be mandatory for presence of myeloid fibrosis as a disease. In a new edition of a WHO classification of the myeloproliferative neoplasms published in April of this year, we have witnessed division of a myeloid fibrosis diagnostic process in two parts. One, what I have described, more aggressive advanced disease with a lot of uh, fibers in the bone marrow, high-grade fibrosis, and the earlier stage myeloid fibrosis with uh, hardly any fibers in the bone marrow, but with the presence of all these other factors. So our ways of making diagnosis of myeloid fibrosis is evolving as we learn about the genetic complexity. We also learn about different aspects of other parts of the disease and fibrosis grade in particular. Myeloid fibrosis is a chronic disorder uh, and there are patients who will de develop or transform into acute myeloid leukemia. Uh, you know, interestingly, the International Working Group looked at several prognostic factors and uh, looked at outcomes, specifically death. And about 15% of those patients who had a known identifiable uh, death uh, died of transformation to acute leukemia. Now, there are those patients who, where death was unclassified or un who just wasn't known, but of the patients who had a known cause of death, about 15% of those were due to acute leukemia, and the rest were due to a myriad of problems, including infection, uh, bleeding risk, uh, complications from their own disease. Remember, these patients are often older patients, and so they die of, of things that older patients die of, uh, coronary vessel disease, vascular disease, uh, but it's, so it's a multitude of issues. Uh, acute leukemia is the big problem because once acute leukemia develops in patients with a history of chronic myeloproliferative diseases, including myeloid fibrosis, current treatment strategies are really ineffective. Uh, so it's a multitude of issues, 15% or so about acute leukemia, and the rest including infection, bleeding, and then other uh, problems associated with age. The watershed for our understanding of the biology of the disease talking about myeloid fibrosis, and for developing a new therapy was a discovery of a mutation called JAK2V617F in 2005. At that point in time, that was the new, completely novel discovery of first ever genetic mutation in myeloproliferative neoplasms that led to a development of a JAK inhibitors and further looking into what is the consequence of that mutation and if there are any other. And yes, there are many others. To start with the biology part, there is a color reticulin mutation and a MEPL mutation. These are other two mutations that, along with the JAK2 mutation, lead to activation of a jak pathway. That is the underlying biological problem in myeloid fibrosis. And since then, there are many other mutations that have nothing to do with the jak pathway that have been discovered in patients with myeloid fibrosis. I'm talking about 25, 30 mutations. The number keeps enlarging. These other mutations like epigenetic control and other aspects of the biology of the disease are present in addition to uh, driver mutations, the three driver mutations, the JAK2, MEPL, and uh, color reticulin. The presence of these other mutations can influence the outcome of the patients in addition to prognostication of the patients based on the traditional factors like uh, age, symptoms, and blood cell count. One 
can certainly ask the question whether one or the other of the driver mutation or one or the other or a number of the additional mutations matter for the outcome of the patients. So, for example, if we analyze patients' outcome based on the presence of calerticoin versus MIPL versus JAK2 mutation or having none of the three, we now know that patients with calerticoin mutation have better outcome than patients with a triple negative disease and the JAK2 and MIPL mutations presence is a kind of in the middle for the outcome. However, the additional mutations, those that I mentioned, about 25, 30 other mutations, if they are present, they can also influence the outcome of the patients. The number of them or the type of them can identify patients at a high risk of progression or even transformation to acute myeloid leukemia. It's becoming very complicated. 